Tyler is a final year student, uh, engineering student at Massey University. He was the lead organizer for the Successful Technology Summer Challenge, a holiday program focused on getting higher student engagement in STEM. I'm sure we don't need to be reminded that that stands for Science, Technology, Engineering and Maths. Um, he's currently researching what makes programs like this successful. So thank you. Thanks, Claire. Hello, everyone. Um, so this is, this is Tyler. We'll do a bit of a double act. Basically, I'll go first, and then um, Tyler will talk. But it may be that we have a difference of perspective on things. Um, me working in a library and Tyler being an engineering student. It's like, what? <laughs> um, bound to be differences there. So um, yeah, Tyler, feel free to chip in if I misrepresent you, and then I'll I'll feel free as well. For those who've just come in, we've just started. Come, there are plenty of seats. Thank you. Okay, um, so we'll be talking about technology programming, and by programming we don't mean as in sort of programming code, but um, learning programs um, in libraries. Um, so I'll, I'll be representing the kind of library perspective and then Tyler will be talking about it from the engineering perspective. And then we'll share the story of two highly engaging um, programs uh, from 2015 and 2016. Um, Tech Challenge was this mutually beneficial partnership between Massey University School of Engineering and Palmerston North Library. Um, during the talk, we'll be talking about three problems that face libraries and hence the world. Um, and then how those three problems can act as a kind of catalyst for um, quite a wonderful solution. Um, but first, I'd like to just acknowledge the team. We've got three of them here. Jamie's at the back. Sorry to embarrass you, Jamie. She's waving her pen. Um, uh, Sean is over here. He's always the guy with the coolest t-shirt just <laughs> always and um, and of course Tyler um, Warwick and Harley sadly um, aren't here with us but um, it really was hard work from all of those people um, I didn't do any of the hard work I just got to do the fun kind of stuff um, so um, the th the three problems the first one is for public libraries and for those of you who are in libraries or museums or archives or almost any organization, you're feeling this pressure from technology. Digital technology is bringing about this kind of pressure. We need a 3D printer. We need to do virtual reality. Oh no, it's augmented reality. No, it's mixed reality. And there's that kind of pressure um, to do this stuff. On top of, not it doesn't replace our traditional services, this is on top of what we're already doing, like these um, traditional services. And so um, in the previous decade, it was all about free Wi-Fi and, and free internet at libraries and, and the transformation that that brought about. And now it's more about maker spaces and 3D printers um, and also about highly engaging STEM programming. How are we going to do that? And so there's this kind of pressure that um, that is being brought to, to bear. Um, and I think with especially news of closures of libraries in uh, abroad and the pressure that we're feeling on budgets make us feel, oh, we have to prove our relevance. And that's part of that, that pressure. And we sometimes turn to technology as a way of trying to prove our, our relevance. Um, so um, this kind of leads to a second pressure maybe, which is, um, so this desire to deliver these um, highly relevant programs to do with technology um, can sometimes lead to, well, it can expose that we just don't have the digital skills in-house. And that certainly is happening um, with us. I'm sure it's happening in your organization as well. And so um, this was something that Sarah Kennedy addressed 
yesterday in her talk that often graduates are are leaving um, their courses and getting a job in, say, a library, but they're not really equipped to do this kind of thing. Um, and that just is a real problem, but the desire is there. And we're talking about basic digital skills, but also the more advanced digital fluencies and just that wonderful affinity with technology that some people seem to have and that we don't seem to have so much in our organizations. And not to mention the so-called 21st century skills that we all need to be masters of now as well and be able to, to develop programs that include those. Um, and there's a third problem and that is we don't always understand why we're doing these things. We just feel the pressure and we're doing it and we're trying to learn and trying to catch up. But why are we doing 3D modeling, for example? So this is something that, um, that's a screen grab from one of the Mac workstations that members of the public can come and use at the library. Why are we doing 3D modeling? This is something that Tyler should be doing. He's the engineer why we're doing it in libraries. And so we kind of don't really understand the why of, um, of all of that sort of thing. Um, but um, these problems and these pressures can lead, and I think they can be um, a catalyst for the development of some really nice solutions. And so, um, yeah, so last year, um, um, Sean actually um, set up some uh, 3D printing workshops with schools and rather than trying to do it all himself we inv invited in school teachers and their whole classes into the library into this tech environment and then that allowed for this sort of staff development in a kind of pressure cooker environment and Sean's nodding his head because that's probably what it felt like because suddenly he was the learning support in this classroom and had to know how to do this, do all of this stuff. And, you know, and did a fantastic job. And there was this amazing level of engagement that just struck us was, wow, something's happening here. Incredible engagement. It was because we allowed the teacher to be the teacher. And so staff like Sean could be the facilitator in that environment. Um, I think that also um, this sort of lack of in-house skills can be a catalyst for developing really high-value partnerships. And this is kind of where Tyler comes in. These were um, students, engineering students, one year ahead of Tyler. Um, they're fourth-year engineering students. They had a problem, and we had a problem. We had four 3D printers and we kind of knew how to do some basic stuff but they seemed to break down all the time and these f four engineering students were trying to finish their, f their final year project and it w they were making this astonishing machine that had 78 3D printed highly technical parts and all the 3D printers up at Massey Engineering were being used and they said, can we use your 3D printers? And we said, yes, please. And we put them in a public environment, um, a really public space in the library, and we said, go for your life. And pretty soon the whole place was just swamped with chip packets and V cans and... <laughs> <laughs> but also kids and families, like little kids dragging mum and dad, come and see what what's happening and it was so exciting to see that iterative de design process as they um, did the 3D design, they did the printing, it didn't work, they redid it and read it and read it till it worked and we thought well magic is happening here, what are the ingredients? And it was really um, that we had engineering students and technology and members of the public and especially um, kids. Um, so this leads to the, um, to the third, um, I guess, um, solution. So the problem that I mentioned earlier was why are we doing this stuff? Like why do we care? We're libraries, we're museums, we're archives, 
galleries? Why are we caring about this stuff? And so around about that time that all this was happening, um, the Science Communication uh, Conference happened in Palmerston North. And one of the speakers said, hey, um, there's this real problem. 75% uh, of primary school kids are loving STEM in schools. And then something happens in the translation from primary to the NCA choices, and it's going down to 25%. And this was kind of borne out as well as we started talking to, um, to Massey Engineering. They were saying, yeah, like we're, we're actually struggling to recruit enough students into these kind of <coughs> subjects. Um, and this sort of corresponds with another really interesting one, which is that there's this sort of boy-girl gap as well, which is also roughly 75%, 25% um, choosing engineering. And this is, um, uh, this is just a really good blog post on um, core education, just about that. And so we started asking the question, well, why are boys coming to these programs and girls aren't so much. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's kind of how Technology Challenge was, was born, was around that. And so we um, talked to Massey Engineering. They had a problem. They couldn't recruit enough kids, and they definitely couldn't recruit enough female students. And so they had a problem. We had a problem, we got together, it became a partnership, it was really mutually beneficial. And this is kind of where Tyler comes in because it was around about this time that um, Tyler's professor put out a call for a student to work with the library on this program. And um, yeah, so Tyler, take it away yeah. from here. Cool. Just cool, so yes, I'm Tyler. Um, I'm not really from the glam sector. I am an engineer and um, I thought I'd obviously point out the obvious. I'm drastically younger than many people. Um, not only like in number but also in look as well. Um, but that's all right. Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit of an interesting one. It's really, it's really inspiring to see quite a few um, people older than myself actually technologically savvy. Um, it's quite bizarre, <laughs> but it's an awesome environment to be in nonetheless. So, so where I jump in is um, with, with this tech challenge business. So I thought I'd just tell a story about what we did um, or what myself and some others did, and um, hopefully it sounds pretty cool. So Technology Summer Challenge. So the first one was presented to me as pretty much a, what will happen if we get an engineering student library staff and a bunch of kids together and try and make something happen. So we decided that we would um, run a program over six weeks and involve, it had 12 two hour sessions, so we had 24 hours in total. Um, and we basically wanted to get these kids doing projects um, or doing a project called, called the challenge because project or school is not cool so it's, it's a challenge um, and so we got them to build robots from scratch um, over six weeks so basically the stuff we sort of taught them or how it sort of worked was we gave them a scenario to start off with so the scenario for the technology summer challenge was that of civil defense so there had been an earthquake off the coast of Himitangi, Palmerston North was in ruins, the civil defence was scrambling, there was a tsunami coming and they needed to make a robot that would fulfil certain criteria that we presented them as well. So the criteria we gave them was one, it had to fit through a certain dimension gap that was sort of to make sure they didn't build anything stupidly big um, and then secondly it had to carry a camera and record the whole process um, so that it would, it would go inside a building, see if anyone's in there in danger or in need and then it would come out again. And then the third thing was it had to survive a drop test, so we'd, we'd pretty much run it off a cliff and see what happens, um, just because just kids like that sort of stuff. Um, and so we gave them this scenario, gave them this criteria, and decided to sort of do lots of mini challenges that build into this big, longer challenge. So the sort of stuff we covered was, um, we sort of covered soldering, we covered piece, like printed circuit board manufacture, components, like electronic components, 3D printing and design, so there's some soldering, um, 
prototyping, construction, all contributing to this much longer challenge over a long period of time, this six week course. Um, so it was really involving and then we finished with a finale. So, oh here was a break, we had a, we had a session where we just broke a bunch of electronics. That was our electronics learning session, it was quite fun. Um, so, then we, so then we finished with the finale. So from my perspective, I had to sort of juggle the idea of meeting the library's needs while also meeting the university's needs. And so part of that was having a finale that was held at my university, at Massey, where the kids got a tour of the place and got to see how awesome engineering is and hopefully they'll end up doing it. Um, so we finished with that finale. And so that was a technology summer challenge and it really inspired me um, because it was the first time I had a job that didn't really feel like a job. I was just playing around, it was really fun. And so it inspired me to actually do some research into this. So as part of my final fourth year project, I conducted research into what makes certain outreaches successful, what factors um, contribute to its success and how we can measure its success. So we, or I came up with these five factors. So the five factors were like a real world context, so the scenario we sort of presented, hands on experiments, which the kids love, um, peer to peer interaction and project based learning. Uh, we also had parental involvement, so interacting with the parents as well is really important. And lastly, um, a key mentor that's very committed, or several key mentors that are committed. Um, so with that in mind, we designed the technology challenge, which obviously just wasn't run in summer. Um, so we had the technology challenge, which was a smaller version of the technology summer challenge. It ran over four weeks, um, and it involved less electronics and more physics, which sounds boring, but it was actually really cool. So we had... It was rocketry themed, so we gave them the theme of, or well, the scenario that Rocket Lab in Auckland, who's a local company making rockets, um, was exploring hydro-powered rockets and wanted to see um, how they can integrate hydro-powered rockets, like water-powered rockets, into their own systems. And so basically there was a real ramp that way to say, kids, let's make some bottle rockets. <laughs> so we ended up designing bottle rockets and doing the same sort of system where we did smaller challenges that all added up to this final challenge. So we just we explored things like aerodynamics. The we actually went over the three laws of physics, and the kids actually liked it, which was awesome. We did 3D printing and design. Um, we went through the scientific method several times. So make a hypothesis, do a test, iterate, iterate, iterate. Um, and we also did a lot of construction. And this was like a spaceman challenge as well, where they had to stay dry while they did it. So some 3D printing and design. And similarly, we ended with another finale as well. So, oh, we there. there we go. So our finale um, was held in a much more public space this time because it wasn't so much partnered with the university other than just me running it. Um, and so we held it at, and we also couldn't do it inside because it was rockets. Um, so we did, it, we did it in the square in Palmerston North, which is a very open public space. And um, if you can see here that, is actually a rocket taking off, so that was pretty cool. Um, and there's a lot of parents involved, so that's ticking that box of getting the parents involved as much as you can. And so I evaluated this program and also reflected back on our other program, and that all contributed to my research. Um, and so we had a couple of learnings from running these two programs. So what did we actually learn? Um, firstly, we have this, this, um, this method of where the library facilitates a STEM program. Um, that, to me, was one of the key aspects. Leith talked about it a little bit, where there's the problem that the library has this stuff, but sometimes they don't know how to use it, or if they do, they don't know how to use it very advancedly, right? Um, and so that leads to the next time where you get expertise from schools or tertiary educations. Like myself, I'm not an expert, but I can use 3D printers reasonably well and stuff like that. And so tapping into those exp expertise around your local city or whatever was part of that, that fundamental knowledge. Um, and then thirdly, the design with the five success factors. So those were a real world context, so developing that scenario for the kids, tying it into what they're actually doing in life. Um, hands on experiments, so getting them to just play and tinker and do things themselves. Uh, lots of peer-to-peer -peer interaction, so getting them in groups, changing groups, making them interact with each other, and then also the project-based learning, so doing a challenge over a long period of time. And then also um, parental involvement, so 
involving parents as much as you can. Um, it's, it's difficult with these sorts of programs to involve parents because a lot of the time it's run during the holidays and trying to find that time where the parents will come is really difficult. So the way we sort of solved that was just doing these big finales held from 5.30 onwards on a Friday or something and that really got parents coming and they'd come pick up their kids and the kid would go, oh mum come see what I've made da, da, da. and they come along and that's always good as well. And then lastly having a, having a key mentor um, and I sort of looked at mentor because when I looked at the literature and stuff like that when I was doing my research, men, a key mentor was one of the one of the more important aspects or was said to be the most important but the problem is that it had so many different definitions of what a mentor was and so I sort of just defined it as like normally when I write it I write mentor like this because it had things from like a caring and loving adult to like a highly skilled educated expert and stuff like that so a mentor to me was just someone who had these characteristics where yes they loved the kids yes they were educated in their area and yes they were just hands-on with the kids good role model and just taking part in what they're doing and so that's essentially what we learn and that's essentially the tech challenge and the tech summer challenge both of which um, were in my eyes and based on an actual reasonably scientific evaluation were both pretty successful and I think I missed it before so I just quickly um, we did an evaluation to the first challenge so the technology summer challenge and um, and we got a couple quotes from some parents and some kids so I'll just read these out just to give you the vibe of what the parents and the kids were feeling at the end of the program so the first one was from a parent thank you so much for providing a great opportunity for young people to try something new to learn new skills and to meet others that like to learn and then secondly from a parent as well thanks so much for creating such a positive challenging and collaborative initiative in Palmerston North and then lastly this is easily my favorite quote from one of the kids it says the program was awesome do it again because I will keep doing it until I'm too old to apply <laughs> and so yeah that's the technology challenge and um, if you guys have any questions Leith will answer them <laughs> yeah Tyler does kind of fit all of those definitions of mentor you know he's a caring and loving adult as well as a a highly, um, highly trained expert in his field as well. And I guess that's really um, mostly the reason for the success is to get the right person to be the, to be the partner. So well done, Tyler. Good job. Any questions? Um, you mentioned before about um, library staff not having um, as many skills. What was the kind of the transference of skills to the library staff from what sounds like an amazing project? So, just, you know. Yeah, um, I don't know if Jamie or Sean would like to answer that question. Um, Jamie's, yeah, actually both of them, I think they're best to answer. Okay, so when we had the first uh, Tech Summer Challenge, um, I was part of a digital team, so and I was learning on the job, so I had a lot of, um, website kind of skills, didn't know how to solder, didn't know how to build anything. So every time we had a two hour session, I had a half hour beforehand and I said to Tyler, show me how to do this really, really quickly. <laughs> so I learned how to solder. I mean, a lot of this stuff doesn't take all that effort. It just takes a little bit of interest. And if you're interested in something, it doesn't take too long to pick up a small skill. Then you do the next thing and then you do the next thing and then you do the next thing. Then by the time you've done half a dozen things, you suddenly realize you can actually show this to somebody else. So we got to the second one and I felt a lot more confident with helping the kids to, to do certain things. All it takes is a little bit of your own interest and maybe a little bit of your own time. You can learn whatever you want to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sean's also yeah, going to answer. Yeah, oh yeah, cool. I just had a question about what's next. Oh my goodness. What's next for the library? Okay, <laughs> um, okay well, sadly, um, What's next is probably that Tyler is going to zoom off and do something else totally amazing, unfortunately not in the library. Um, but we would absolutely love to do more with Massey. Um, we've got such a good relationship with them now and we kind of know a lot of the professors and um, yeah, so we just, we want to do the next thing. And I think, you know, Sean and Jamie and Harley um, and others just want to do the next 
the next one. We don't know what it's going to be, but we'll just keep kind of pushing in this direction because there's such a demand from the parents and from the, the kids. And something you may also have noticed in the photographs was all the little siblings, the little brothers and sisters coming along as well. And they were just amazingly interested. And um, yeah, it was just really cool the way that the team and Tyler handled the little siblings as well, like planning little mini challenges for them to do as well. So they could all line up and launch their own bottle rocket as well. And I think it just really kind of magnified the positive impact because that whole family kind of went home with such a buzz. Anyway, I'm not really answering your question, but um, anyway, over to Tyler to tell you what's next for him. <laughs> um, so for me personally, um, I am actually have moved to Auckland, so I'm not necessarily going to be doing much with the public library, but I'm going to be, I've, this is not really related to anything, but I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be a teacher, so I've done a bit of a career switch from engineer, um, and so I'm still an expert in my field, uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna switch over to do teaching, so I'm actually gonna be a maths teacher at, at Mount Oscar Grammar in Auckland. So I got into a into a really um, vigorous uh, graduate program and called Teach First NZ. If you want to look them up, um, and so they they cover a lot of my costs and stuff, which is awesome. So that that's what's next for me. But I would love to, because this is a two year program. I'd love to be able to make an impact on. STEM education because I don't think it's necessarily run all that great in schools. Um, so whether that means stepping out of schools and going into more outreach programs um, and just making a national and hopefully global impact, um, that would be that would be awesome. But that's pretty long long term. Yeah. <laughs> Any libraries in Auckland want to grab Tyler while he's <laughs> up there? And <laughs> I can highly recommend the experience. Cool, no more questions. I think we're just about done then. Thank you. Sorry, I'm kind of taking over the role of the chair. Did you want to <laughs> say anything? <laughs> Sorry. Cool, thanks, guys. Thanks. Okay.